Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Folks are pouring into the room here. So I'm uh, excited that you all could join us. We're going to get started in just a moment or two, but in the meantime, we're, uh, we're going to let some folks pour into the Zoom room and make sure that we're up and running on Facebook, which I believe we are. Are we live over there? I'm confirming that right now for us. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to let everybody continue filing in and uh, double check that we are all good on Facebook. Yep, we're live and all good on Facebook. We're all good on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Welcome. Glad you could join us. Thanks for coming by. We're, as I've been saying, we are going to get started in just another minute or so. And uh, in the meantime, just let everybody file their way in and get comfortable. So welcome to the tea room. And we're going to go ahead and get things going on Facebook. So Facebook is live. Great. Hello, Facebook. If you're on Facebook and uh, you would like to join us on Zoom, just sit tight for a minute or two and one of our moderators will put the link to the Zoom in a comment on the Facebook post. And that way you'll be able to come over here and find us on Zoom. If you're on Zoom already, please jump into the chat room and say hello, but please, please, please make sure to change that little drop down above the message box to say panelists and attendees, because otherwise y'all can't see each other and uh, that's way less fun. There we go. Looks like it's working. Also, if you're here in uh, Zoom, when it comes time for Q&A, and you're welcome to get started throwing questions in early, but if it comes time for Q&A, there's an actual Q&A button in Zoom, and that's what you use to ask your question. So we won't be taking questions in the chat room in Zoom, just the Q&A box. But over in Facebook, if you want to ask questions and you don't want to come over to Zoom, that's totally fine. You're welcome to just continue to stream live on Facebook and you can ask your questions in comments on the Facebook post. So please do feel free to do that. Those of you who are tuning in, uh, please do let us know in the chat room uh, or in the Facebook comments where you're tuning in from. And if you are in the chat room, just make sure that little drop down is set to all panelists and attendees. Looks like our numbers have leveled out for the most part here. We got a few people filtering in, but they're not going up quite as fast. So I guess we can get started with some tea with Lee, which means it's time to say hi to Lee. Hi, Lee. Hey, Ben. How are you, man? How are you? Doing great, thanks. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. First, first tea session in 2021. Is indeed. Well, not mine, but ours together. Ours together. <laughs> yes, indeed. I, I yes. knew you probably brought the new year in with a cup of tea. I did indeed. And uh, yeah, actually, I, I did have tea at midnight. Yep. Enough. I don't really drink champagne or what have you. So I was the weirdo. <laughs> I pour tea for a whole group, uh, you know, at, at New Year's uh, just after after midnight. It's Excellent. great for clearing out any uh, any alcohol that you might have consumed. So mm, that's true. Pu'er is kind of known for uh, is a good alcohol balancer. Detox. It's a preventer. great hangover remedy. Yeah. Well, happy New Year! I'm stoked that we're back together and uh, that we're going to be doing tea today. We've got a lot of folks hanging out here in the Zoom room with us, and I presume a lot of you over there on Facebook. Hi, Facebook. <laughs> So here's what we're gonna do, everybody. We're gonna get started with a little bit of a, uh, a moment of getting present, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on, and then we're gonna do a Q&A session, and then we're gonna finish up and go on about our day. So that's pretty much the plan. If you didn't hear my previous comments, please jump into the chat room, talk amongst yourselves in the Zoom room, but definitely make sure that little panelists uh, drop down is set to panelists and attendees so you can talk amongst yourselves. Otherwise, it just comes to us and we're too busy talking to see it. So <laughs> we'd love to have you all uh, share with one another. 
Also, if you're in Zoom, you want to ask questions, please do feel free to go down to that Q&A button and we will be spending a lot of time later answering questions and getting uh, all of those handled or as many as we can get through. There's usually way more than we can do, but we'll do what we can. And if you're on Facebook, feel free to put comments in the thread if you want to ask questions there. And later on, Zach's going to bring over some of the questions from Facebook and we will answer a few of those as well many as we can. So it's good stuff. All right. Looks like folks are uh, making it making it happen over here. What are you drinking today, Mr. Holden? I am drinking a little Trinity again, but what I did want to show you was this cool cup. And I think, Ben, I got you one of these cups from uh, this company, but they, it's very heavy. It feels like, uh, it feels like twice the weight that it should, but look at that nice spiraling energy in the bottom. Gorgeous. I love it up right there. That's a great size too. Yeah, it feels very uh, celebratory, like a ch like a tea chalice. Yeah, and and the love the uh, the glaze on it. Do you have a pot that fills it perfectly? Is that kind of yeah, a great I do. Time? And this is a pot that um, I had gifted to somebody, my brother and sister in law, and they um, said, you know what, we this is three years later, they said, you know, we just don't drink out of this teapot because it's too small for us. So they gave it back to me and it fills this cup perfectly. So nice. that's yeah. a beautiful little kit. <laughs> yep, it's a nice little solo session. Well, indeed you did. He gave me a, a whole set of those and a, and a guy one also, which is solid and heavy and has a lid and it's great for brewing uh, chunky leaves. Where can we get the cups? That's a great question. Um, so I'm drinking Heaven's Nest. Heaven's Nest is this mm -hmm. tiny little uh, tocha. I don't even know if there is anymore. I kind of hope there is because I forgot how good it is. It's been a long time since I've drunk this. And I'm drinking it out of my uh, same bowl I was using last time, I think. Got a couple other folks out there drinking Trinity. Please go ahead in the chat room and let us know what you're drinking. Mm. And, uh, oh, it's so good. <laughs> Trinity was my uh, my midnight tea because it's such a good tea for late nights. So it was my midnight on New Year's tea. And uh, that was a pretty rich experience. There you are, Lee. We got ginger tea. We got Trinity tea. We got raw puer for morning energy. Woo, Eileen, going big. More ginger tea. A lot of ginger folks over here. Dinong ginseng scent ripe puer. Hmm. Ginseng and ripe puer. It's probably pretty delicious. Someone's drinking a chocolate puer, which uh, that's not a bad combination. It's true, yeah. The uh, chocolate puer that I had was, I guess, a new me teas. Yeah. And I found the, um, the energy of it was so weird, it put me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it got so uppity that it put you, it put you down. Yeah, I think it just put me, I, it's so weird. Yeah, it was a strange experience because um, both myself and my girlfriend at the time, she actually had to drive up, was driving up to San Francisco that day and I was going to work in an office down the way here in Santa Cruz. And I could have, I, I thought I was gonna fall asleep. I was just like <laughs> utterly exhausted. She had to pull over on the side of the road and not fall asleep. I and mean, we're talking like, you know, noon. Oh my gosh. Very good wow. experience. So, okay. Anyway, that's just me. But her too. So it wasn't just me. <laughs> and lavender tea. That sounds good. Dragon elixir, which is puer with osmanthus flower and lemon balm. Mushroom matcha. That sounds like a good one. It does. That's not going to put you to sleep. We got a, a puer shang 7542 Menghai 1999. So we got a, a, a somewhat mature. Probably not quite dark yet, but um, probably pretty bright and yet well on its way. Uh, Menghai raw tea from 21 years ago, 22 years ago now. <laughs> Coffee, please don't banish me. Okay, you're forgiven. <laughs> South American tea. Yep. Well, uh, Mr. Holden, how about if you take a moment and help us get present and settled and... Uh, and sounds we'll wonderful. Kind of get in our bodies here for a minute. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, you know, my daughter was reading one of the holiday cards that we got from a friend, and she read, 
I hope, she was reading it out loud as I was driving up the driveway, this, this holiday card. I hope Zozi is wonderful for you this year. And I was like, Zo who's Zozi? And she goes, I don't know, the card says Zozi. And I looked at it and it was 2021, but she read it as Zozi. So I'm kind of wishing everybody a happy Zozi this year because, you know, let's do something different than last year. Absolutely. That's <laughs> happy Zozi to you. Happy Zozi. Okay. So that is one of the baby's nicknames now, Zozi. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cute. I think this, this baby has more nicknames than, um, than anybody in, in three weeks that, that I've seen. Yeah. Heard about. <laughs> As they're on a roll. Yep. If she's uh, if she's up for it, she might make an appearance and say hi to you guys. Oh, cool. Well, you guys, happy 2021. Happy Zozi. Let's take a moment to pour ourselves some tea and get present. Let's take a moment to set our intentions on what it is that we want to create this year. And it could be, you know, today can be this week. And we can also look at the whole year ahead of us. When we're setting intentions, part of it is to set the horizon of time, meaning it's good to gauge your intention, your mind to, to a particular horizon in time because our days and our weeks lead into our day, uh, into our years. And so we want to create those stepping stones that will provide us with a larger horizon of time that will create that year that we want to have. So some, some of the work that I've been doing in my, in my journal is to write down my ideal day or a few ideal days, an ideal week, and then what I want to create this year. And that really helps to, to bring into clarity a fuller picture. So Let's take our teacup like we do by our hearts and let's just switch things up. Instead of being grateful for things in our past, let's look into the year ahead and conjure up some gratitude for the wonderful things to come. And if you wanted to make a little circular motion, feeling this pulling in towards the heart, like you're magnetizing those experiences that you want to have in towards you, like the fragrance of a beautiful flower, draw in those positive, rich, life rewarding experiences towards you. And take a deep breath into that. And we go beyond time and space, feeling the gratitude for those experiences those experiences that are to come, but feeling as if they're happening right here, right now. And we'll take a nice big sip of tea. And here's to going beyond time and space and being the masters of our destiny. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll drink to that. Very nice. Yeah, I'm... I'm uh... I feel like Zozi is going to be a very different year. And for a lot of folks, I think that's going to be quite a relief. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this year, uh, it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I, I feel like there's a lot of a lot of unknowns, but my sense is that it's all going to kind of crystallize into something a little more solid and a little less uh, tumultuous. Yeah. And I feel like we're, we're better equipped too. We're more prepared. We've had some practice and that as, uh, even if things stay similar for a little while, we have more inner resources. Mm. Maybe as you go through the beginning of this year, you can feel your toolbox of inner resources a little fuller. And then as we emerge out of it, your potential for gratitude is much stronger based on the year that we've had and the challenges that we've overcome. Mm -hmm. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, for us here at Holden Qigong, we've got a lot of um, fun things that we're starting to do. We uh, just recently put out a, um, a survey, or maybe it's coming out soon, I'm not sure, but asking folks what workshops uh, they like, just for open-ended ideas initially 
we have a lot of ideas. And so uh, we're not going to do everything you say, but <laughs> we're going to do the ones that um, seem to be current, uh, common. We're going to put them out and actually give folks a chance to, uh, to weigh in on what kind of workshops they want this year, because I think the, um, the things that we have on the roster, we have quite a few already, but we're really starting to feel like we figured out how to ask um, people in our audience what they want without overwhelming our customer service department so much that they, they can't handle it. <laughs> so thankfully now we can ask more questions and try to get in people's input because I think that's important. And it's always felt like one of those things I'd like to do, but um, was hard to do because the customer service department just get completely buried. So stoked that we figured that out and uh, you should be receiving an email if you haven't already about that. And any ideas you have, please send them in. We'd love to, love to have them. Kudos to our support team. Thank you, Lori, that's sweet. And then uh, I know we have Dow Yin coming up. I'm excited about that too. That's going to be a, uh, a pretty interesting experience. I was doing a little bit of that yesterday and uh, just really looking forward to it. How about you, Lee? Absolutely. You know, I've been, um, you know, sometimes when I teach a workshop or a big series of workshops, it, it lines me up to that practice. So I'm, you know, every evening it's been my evening go to practice these days, just going through my notes and practicing. And it reminds me of the, the old days when I was ghostwriting for Montauk Chia in um, 1994, working on Dalian in the book. Um, and I would be doing it either in the late hours of the night or the wee hours of the early morning. And I just, it's just such a great practice to, you know, stretch out the body, calm the mind, cultivate yin energy. It's a great practice before going to sleep. And uh, I'm, in, I'm really enjoying picking it up and, and orienting towards this workshop that's going to be four weekends long. And we're going to stretch it out over those over four months, which is going to give us, you know, quite a bit of time in between to practice it and integrate it. So I feel like it's a great workshop to start off 2021 and really orient towards the meridian lines, getting strong and flexible, getting that chi flowing. So I'll, I am very excited for it. So I think it's going to be wonderful. Me too. Yeah. One of the, one of the fun things that we're going to do also is have, um, which we, we did a test run of while you were out right after the baby was born and your mom was also uh, down in, in baby mode and everybody was hunkering down. We didn't have anybody to teach for a couple of days and we decided to try a practice party and it worked out really well. People really seemed to enjoy it. So that was kind of a test run for the, the plan, which was during those months in between actually running a few of these practice parties to get the community and of students together and have a chance to practice uh, in a group. So that'll be a fun addition, which is basically where we replay the routines from the um, training from that weekend through Zoom and uh, get together. And those of you can, can kind of practice in community because I have found, I think we've all found, that when we're practicing at the same time, even separated by distance, we can all kind of drop in to each other's energetic field. And it's just a remarkable experience. We didn't anticipate that when we started doing all this Zoom work at the beginning of the coronavirus issues. And it's like, wow, this really is potent. Um, <laughs> so we wanted to provide more opportunities to get together on the in-between. And so this four months, we'll have several practices in addition to the uh, once a month training for the full weekend. And I think it's gonna be great. Indeed, no separation, says Natasha. That's right. Rowana says, I really enjoyed the classes with Lee's mom. <laughs> I could tell she's uh, probably from somewhere other than the US because she said mom. <laughs> oh yeah. Shout out. Lee's folks did a lovely job while you written away. Hmm. UK. There you go. Thanks, Rowan. So, uh, Mr. Holden, how do you feel about answering some questions? Let's do that. Ah, that feel great. Mm -hmm. Let's cool. dive into the Q&A. Yep, let's do it. It is time for some Q&A. Now, if you haven't already heard, here's how we're doing Q&A on Zoom, is that uh, we're doing it through the Q&A button here in Zoom. So find the Q&A button. Uh, for most people, it's probably down at the bottom of the screen. And we're not really taking questions from the chat room here in Zoom. We're taking them from the Q&A button, which gives us 
uh, an easy way to keep track of them. If you're on Facebook and you'd like to ask a question, just put it in a comment on the post that you're watching this live on right now. And we'll get to as many of those as we can later when Zach brings them over from Facebook to share with us here. So there you have it. That's how to do it. And uh, Mr. Holden, any of them jump out at you right away? Well, Natasha's first question, uh, she would like to know more about how to take notes like the girl in the university. There's a story I tell about um, a very challenging uh, psychology class. It was actually a statistics class and everybody's frantically taking notes. You know, there's two or 300 kids in this class you know, frantically taking notes. And I noticed this woman sitting next to me was just like in meditation, listening to the lecture. And she didn't, wasn't taking any notes when I inquired about it. She was saying that she was doing this meditation and this Zen practice uh, about how to calm the mind and stay in a relaxed state so that she could remember the, um, the lectures. And um, I think part of her trick was to do some memory tricks. So there are some ways in which you can use your mind and your memory to associate um, with a pre already a list that's pre recorded in your mind that you already have this list. And then you just start to hang. Uh, they call it like pinning. You, you pin the notes in your mind as you're listening to a lecture. But part of it really was to stay in a very relaxed state because recall is an interesting thing. You know, when you're trying to remember something too hard, it goes further and further from your memory. And as soon as you relax a little bit more, all of a sudden it pops up into your mind. So part of it was being in this Qigong state of relaxation and then being able to recall and remember the lecture as she did it. So she's in our tier one, Natasha, and was saying that she wanted to be able to use some of those techniques. So it's not that you shouldn't take any notes, but... Um, when you're trying to recall being a state of relaxation, you know, that wisdom Qigong workshop that I taught is very good for memory, recall, focus, thinking, and clarity of mind. So you might want to try that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. The uh, it's fascinating what people are able to do with the mind when they have that sense of uh, relaxation and, and openness and just recording we're, we all record everything 100%. That's why like hypnosis works in police investigations, for example. It's like these things can, can come back out that you didn't even know you were recording. So I can imagine that uh, if you can figure out how to access that, and people with photographic memories or what have you seem to have an act for that. But I, uh, I never have done that myself. I find it... I find it... Uh, for me, if as soon as I write it down, it's like it gets filed away in a different spot and I can access it. And I don't yeah. actually look at my notes very often. Just the act of writing them seems to be the magic trick for me personally. Yeah, that is good. Ben, you have an incredible memory too, by the way, everybody. It's oh, like a, thank you. Like a steel <laughs> trap in there. <laughs> That's what my grandpa would say, mind like a steel trap. So I guess he was right. <laughs> I just thought he was being nice because I was a kid. <laughs> No, you have an incredible memory. <clears throat> you remember the class that you taught in 2018 when you did that pressure point for this, that, and the other? And I was like, oh, that's a good, that's a good memory. Impressed. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's good most of the time, but, you know, occasionally you uh, get stuck remembering things other people would have blocked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, here, along those lines, here's one um, from Bindu. Which are the best exercises to help stop the chatter in the mind and for meditation? Which is an interesting question. I think a lot of us have that question. How do we quiet the mind? And Qigong is, you know, just the, one of the best exercises I find for this particular kind of question. So number one, the mind and the energy of the mind doesn't stop. And it's not that the mind becomes quiet per se. It's that we become the master of our attention and that you can pay attention to the quiet that's already there. There's quiet already there in your mind, like a painter on a blank canvas. When they start to brush the paint onto that canvas, the white canvas is always there. It just takes now the paint in the foreground. 
or music, for example, when you're playing and listening to music, there's always silent spaces between the notes. And if you can pay attention to the silence between the notes, your mind becomes quiet or you recognize the silence that's already there. And so quiet and silence and presence and this moment is always there. What we're doing is tuning our attention to that because quietness isn't something that jumps out in the mind. And in fact, what jumps out of the mind is all the noises and all the things. And so Qigong helps us to be more full circle, like that Zen circle, we become aware of everything, not just the noise or the objects, but the silence and the sound between the noise, or even the space between the objects in the room. Like if you're looking at your room, we don't notice the space and the air because it's, let's call it invisible. But once we put our attention to it, we notice, oh yeah, there is space between all these objects, between the floor and the ceiling. And I can recognize that. And that attentiveness to that spaciousness is often what is called quiet of the mind. Now, how do we help them facilitate this? First, we become relaxed in our bodies. So when you're doing something in and through your body like Qigong practice, a moving meditation, you're clearing the tension. And then the mind starts to settle down like the surface of a lake you know when it's real windy and turbulent the waves become very choppy and as things start to calm down that mountain lake becomes clear and reflective and that's the difference when we're in ordinary state of mind or ordinary state of consciousness it's like the wind picking up the mind becomes very active and then as we do our qigong practice that wind of mental thinking starts to settle down and our mind becomes tuned in and reflective of what's true and what's actually going on in our present moments. And that's part of the practice of Qigong and what you'll find as we continue to do the practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Once upon a time in a, in a previous life, <laughs> well, actually this life, but a previous uh, spiritual group I was in in my 20s, the, it was explained to me once and, and it sort of just totally got it. It's like you're having this, um, communion with the silence, right? That you're having this interaction where you're focused very much on the silence and then, and then on all that unfolds from that silence, which is really quite profound. And it's like you're having this, this conversation, the metaphor was like you're at a restaurant having this deep conversation with your beloved, like you're just totally zoned in. And then way over there, the busser is clattering dishes in the kitchen and this is happening over here. And, all these thoughts are happening. Their mind is doing what the mind does, but it's all the way over there. It's not even really that it, like it happened. It went in through your ears. You could kind of hear the clattering of the dishes, but you're so present to this that it just sort of seems like background noise and it doesn't really interfere. And that's been my experience when it goes quote unquote quiet. Uh, and I think a lot of people have that misconception, right? Is that you're I'm trying to quiet the mind. I'm trying to quiet the mind. Ah, it's just still talking. It's just still talking. So I love what you said about how it's just like mastery of our awareness and our attention. So um, spot on for me. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, Millie's saying, I get confused about the breathing, when to breathe through the nose, when to breathe through the mouth. Uh, here's what we talk about. Breathing is a way to cultivate energy and each breath is a different cultivation. So when you inhale through the nose, we can all try it and you exhale through the mouth, we call that purging, meaning you're getting rid of some energy, you're clearing it out. And when you inhale through the nose and exhale through the nose, try it that all together. Just notice that it brings each one of those breaths has a little bit different effect on your mind, body, energy system. And so when we are, for example, in the beginning of our Qigong class, clearing out tension, and letting go of old energy, we often inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. So that would be called purging. And when we're doing our flows, we often will inhale through the nose and exhale through the nose as a way to strengthen, which is called tonifying. And so those are two exercises that we can do. And then there's other exercises where you might inhale through the mouth and exhale through the mouth. Not very often would you do that, but in certain breathing exercises, you might do that as well. So depending on what kind of energy you want to cultivate, you change the breath to reflect the intention of the exercise. 
<laughs> oh, let's see. Is it possible to modify moving the body like a river for someone who finds it difficult due to a hip injury? Is it possible to do sitting down? So any injury that you have, yes, modify. Modify those exercises so that it feels good to you. In fact, if it doesn't feel good to you because of an injury or whatnot, then just skip. There's plenty of Qigong exercises out there for you. We just need to find exactly the right one. So modify like an exercise, like moving the body like a river. It's a pretty strong exercise. It's a warm up. It strengthens the body and the legs. It's in a deeper stance. So feel free to shorten the stance, stand up taller, or even do it sitting in a chair, like something like this, moving the body like a river from a seated position, still moves all the joints in the spine, still cultivates and circulates energy, but you're just not doing it from that wide leg position. So that way your body is in motion and it feels good to you. And that is very healing. And Samuel, what Qigong could I do in bed uh, as I awaken to get my energy flowing? Also, what might you, what might you suggest to build strength to complement my Qigong routine? Okay, so what to do in and bed and what to do out of bed? Good question. In bed, when, you're, when you wake up in the morning, I often like to just take some slow, deep breaths. So if you wanna hit the snooze button, that could be a seven minute uh, Qigong in bed, little routine that you do, or just as you wake up, you know, one hand on the belly, one hand on the chest and do some wave breathing, belly, ribs, chest. Exhale, chest, ribs, belly, long, slow, deep breaths into the belly, all the way through the ribs, all the way to the chest and then exhale, chest, ribs, belly. And this is a very, um, calming and clarifying it's a regulating breathing so we talked about the breath as a way to cultivate energy this one's not too energizing and it's not too relaxing so it starts to just wake you up gently and then sometimes what i like to do is hug the knees into the chest do a little spinal twist to each side stand up out of bed maybe do a little chi massage and then in five or six minutes you are ready to go for the day mm -hmm. um Samuel also asked what kind of exercises to do. You can really do anything that you'd like. I especially recommend finding exercises and activity that you really like to do. And if you really love to dance, for example, find ways to bring that into your exercise routine. If you like to swim, do that. Because when you like to move your body, when it feels good and it's fun, it's good for your heart, not only your physical heart, but your emotional heart. And so riding a bike, going for a swim, playing a sport with friends, all of that can be very healthy. So, I mean, what I like to do is, for exercise, you know, if you wanted to integrate, it would be to do a little workout, you know, do a little weightlifting, go for a, a nice vigorous walk, and afterwards then do your stretch and flow if you wanted to combine it with your Qigong practice. Otherwise, just do your workout and then do Qigong some other time during the day. And that is fine as well. Uh, Cheryl says, my question has to do with digestion. And she leaves it at that. So uh, digestion, yes. Um, digestion is called, uh, you know, it, it, it's a particular kind of chi that we're cultivating, which is called bu chi, the energy of food. And what we want to be able to do is transform that food into chi, into life force energy. Why are we eating? We often think because it tastes good. Well, you're actually eating for the chi, for the life force energy that it gives you. And two things with digestion. One is your digestive fire. How strong is that fire? And the second is what kind of wood are you putting on that fire? Meaning what kind of food are you eating? And so if you have good fuel, you're eating healthy food and you have a nice strong digestifier, that food gets transformed into energy like a log burning and transforming into heat. But if you have a little fire and a wet log, your digestion is gonna get compromised and that log will smolder and not transform. And so that's, that causes a lot of health problems when we have that kind of smoldering energy for too long in our body. So stoke your digestifier and eat healthy food. And how do we stoke the digestive fire? 
Number one, get out of stress. Take time each and every day to get out of stress because when you're in stress, your energy moves away from the digestive system. So that can be one of the number one things to do to help your digestion. And what is a practice that gets you out of stress? Qigong, a daily practice of Qigong to help clear stress will be one of the best things that you can do for digestion. And then if you want more information, we have the Qigong for Healthy Digestion Workshop. So check that out because we have all kinds of exercises to stoke that digestive fire. And let's see, Ellen, do you know what the activity level is of puer oolong and green teas? No, acidity level. Oh, acidity. Well, that's an interesting one. Um, puer is actually pretty alkaline. And in fact, it's somewhat alkaline forming and it doesn't uh, add acid at all to your system. In fact, it can reduce the acidity in your uh, digestive tract and so forth. And I'm not really sure about oolong and green. I mean, I, I believe that they're all basically alkaline in nature, um, but it's possible that there are certain compounds that the microbial process of puer changes to be more alkaline forming, but it's known to be very alkaline, puer itself. So enjoy. <laughs> yeah, the other interesting thing is that it, uh, it, it is known as a weight loss tea for a number of reasons, but also one of them being that it actually, um, it, it increases the amount of acidity in the bile that's formed, which then breaks down fat more readily. So often uh, back in the original days of puer becoming known outside of Chinese medicine and, and to the general public was in the 1800s when dim sum became a thing in Hong Kong. And they were drinking this dark, dark puer that would be served at the end of a meal after you're sitting there eating all these fatty foods for so long, just a long period of time, this big smorgasbord of uh, dim sum. And then you would uh, drink dark puer and really help you kind of break all that down more effectively. So it's, it sort of became, and then people started to go, whoa, I really like this weird tea. <laughs> and so it became a whole thing where uh, Eastern China now suddenly wanted all this puer, all this old puer from Western China. And they would send all the puer over to Hong Kong and then it would, they would store it in Hong Kong and age it there. And Hong Kong's so incredibly humid that it would actually become somewhat moldy. It would get this kind of blue tinge to it and become somewhat moldy and, and the flavor of rich moldy kind of Hong Kong style puer tea for a lot of folks in Eastern China is considered good aged old puer. So I have some Hong Kong style puers that are, uh, that are a little blue and they have this intense kind of flavor, uh, like a blue cheese is intense compared to other cheeses. And uh, couldn't drink it every day, probably not super healthy for you too, but that's the way they like it in Hong Kong. So that's my story and I'm sticking to mm -hmm. it. Here we go. Kathy, wow, just heard that Ben drinks it at midnight. Well, okay, let's be clear. On New Year's Eve and only Trinity. It's yeah. the one tea that I would drink uh, at that time. And uh, yeah, I was up till three probably. So <laughs> it, may have, it may have been <laughs> tributary. That's good. Yeah, Trinity is great for, you know, drinking and even starting a pot of Trinity at the end of a day can be just fine for me. Yep. Uh, but somebody was asking about drinking puer into the evenings. And one thing you can do is start a pot in the morning or earlier in the day, if you drink it all day long, then when you drink it at night, it's very relaxing. So that is a fine way to drink puer is that if the pot has been, uh, you know, steeped out all day, or even for a day or two, drink that one into the evening, and it's just fine. And in fact, can be quite relaxing. Yeah, once, once the dark teas go quite light, you know, more of a yellow or very light orange, um, then they, they, all of the stimulating compounds have kind of steeped out. And there's a lot of relaxing compounds in tea. That's why it's such a balanced energy compared to coffee. So um, those later, very late steeps can be very relaxing, very sleepy. Barbara says the moldy puer is supposed to be rinsed once before consuming with hot water. I lived in Hong Kong for two years. Absolutely true. And also, so is the dry stored puer. 
pretty much all the brewer just because of its age, it become extremely dry. So to get it to give good oils, kind of have to give it a little moisture so that they come to the surface of the leaf. Uh, so we do that with all the brewers actually. Mm -hmm. Well, someone is asking about reverse breathing and wanted to get my opinion on it. Um, you know, perhaps she was saying, or he was saying doing it in bamboo in the wind after class at the end, what are the benefits? Well, reverse breathing is another breathing exercise that delivers a particular kind of chi. It's a little more advanced because you are say flattening the abdominal muscles or tightening and then trying to reverse the breath and push it into the kidneys or you reverse it by when you inhale, you draw the abdomen in, which normally in Qigong, when you inhale, the abdomen would balloon out. And so by reversing the breath, you are really massaging the organs in a different way. And I usually recommend doing reverse breathing as an exercise. You know, like any exercise, you go to the gym and you say, hey, what, what do I want to do today? You know, I want to do this, this machine, that machine, those weights. Do I want to go for a swim? You know, it's just a different way of exercising the breath. And uh, it's good to do sometimes, but you don't always have to do it. And you don't have to do it in every class. And uh, reverse breathing is a little bit more of a warming up and can be activating. So I might recommend doing it more in the beginning of class. And in fact, if you guys want to try, since we're trying breathing exercises today, try to do a reverse breath. Put your hands on your belly. And now when you inhale, draw the abdomen in and back towards the spine. And when you exhale, balloon the stomach out. And you're massaging the organs and you're sort of reversing the way in which we normally breathe. Now, reverse breathing would be a more advanced breathing practice, uh, meaning that you wanna learn how to breathe into the belly first before you try reverse breathing. You wanna learn how to expand the abdomen on the inhale and even expand into the chi belt and to the kidneys and then do something like reverse breathing. If you're doing it during bamboo in the wind, that's sort of the end of class when you've developed this really refined energy. And so as you start to really bring the breath into a different practice, it might take you out of that flow state or that real blissed out feeling because you're now doing more of an exercise into the breath. So I would recommend doing reverse breathing sometime before flows to really bring in some energy into the belly and then go into flows. And then it's really after flows, it's relaxed, slow breathing in and out through the nose. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my instinct too. The, uh, yeah. the, it feels very energizing when I just did that experiment. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't really done reverse breathing very often, uh, but when I do it, I, I actually find it very energizing and fascinating. Yeah. It, feels it is energizing, yep. And we do sometimes in class, we've done packing breathing. Mm -hmm. That's extremely energizing. And we did packing and a bunch of breathing exercises, different advanced breathing exercises in our iron shirt workshop. So if you're interested in doing some different kinds of breathing exercises, that iron shirt workshop is really good for advanced breath work. Mm -hmm. And speaking Great. of breathing, Carrie's asking what to do about seasonal allergies, pressure points and things like that. Well, large intestine four is a great point for seasonal allergies. That's right there uh, in the webbing between your first finger and thumb. Best known for headaches, but it is good for allergies. And you combine that point with large intestine 20 right here at the sides of the nose. And you hold and massage while you breathe in and out through the nose. Press firmly and circle the fingers. Right, so great points for seasonal allergies. The herbs you might want to take, nettle, as in stinging nettle, as a tincture can be a really great supplement. It's very simple. Just take a few uh, tincture or dropper folds a couple times a day. And nettle is good for a variety of different things, including seasonal allergies. And that with some of those pressure points can be a great regimen for mild seasonal allergies. Acupuncture is great as well. Um, Julia, do you know what to do with eczema on the palms of the hands? So itchy, I tear my hands to pieces. Oh, that's no fun. 
I would say, okay, it's interesting. Palms of the hands have to do with uh, the pericardium and the heart meridians. So I would say thinking of where it's manifesting on those meridian lines, let's clear stress and especially stress in any of relationships, past stress from relationships. Let's do some cleansing and clearing. I would say um, do some healing sounds every evening to clear the heat because eczema is, is a uh, excess heat in Chinese medicine. That's why it comes to the skin and that's why it's red in nature. So we wanna clear the heat and healing sounds are very good for that. You also want to clear stress, any emotional stress, because eczema seems to be connected with the stress response. And then maybe, um, I know dietary, uh, if you clean up the diet, it can be very helpful. So maybe look, uh, work with a nutritionist, check into your diet and making sure there's no food allergies and eating really clean. Any contraindications practicing Qigong with osteoporosis? Um, yeah, there's concern. So you, you just want to be careful, be a little extra careful, you know, um, forward bends. I've heard people say that, you know, in talking to physical therapists, you might want to uh, avoid physical, uh, forward bending. So when we do forward bends, just modify and, um, skip, skip to the next exercise. Um, you could, while we're doing forward bends, you could be doing deep abdominal breathing or kidney breathing, all that breath work. Um, now for osteoporosis, uh, try the Qigong for bones. We have a whole program, Qigong for bones, based on the research that came out of Sh Shanghai, some of the Qigong work that showed to strengthen bone density. So try that routine. Um, somebody has been using my DVDs and want to know if they've been updated in the streaming videos. And uh, I know we have some in our legacy series on our website, so you can look at our website look into the legacy. We have some of those older DVDs that are available for streaming. And then we've just basically updated and refilmed a lot of those programs like Qigong for upper back and neck. We refilmed it in Yosemite. So it's a nicer, you know, all, not only there's some new movements, but it's just the quality that streamed online is much improved. And we've done that with a lot of our titles. Yeah. Depending on whether Patrick's using the original generation of DVDs or this, this new regeneration. Um, in many cases, the new regeneration has in the cases, since the DVDs were put out by a publisher who works with us, um, in the cases, the ability to unlock the streaming version. And the streaming version is much higher resolution. Uh, you know, now that we can all play HD, uh, DVDs don't support HD. And so we're, we're kind of, you know, future proofing or bringing our uh, content up to speed with what people are expecting now. Because now if you look at a DVD on a screen where you're used to watching much higher resolution footage, it just looks fuzzy. <laughs> so it's one of those things we're going to have to keep doing over and over, Lee, because uh, I know keep changing the technology. Yep. That's what happens when technology just keeps getting better and better, huh? Yep. Yeah, it sure does. I'm curious um, if the hula dance has any connection to Qigong. I just couldn't resist that one. That's a great question. And in fact, yes, it does, because the hula dance is, um, you know, I was talking to a dancer in Hawaii some years ago when my twins were little babies and we took them to a, a hula dance show and they were talking about that the hula, the movement of the hands represents the movement of the life force energy. And in Hawaiian, the life force energy uh, was a particular name, and now I'm forgetting mana. it. Say it again? Mana? Or mana. Ika. That's it. And they talk about the life force energy, and the hula is the manifestation of that life force energy and the expression of it. And so different cultures and different times talk about the life force energy in different ways and either do, you know, a dance to it. Um, what I find that's so special about Qigong, it is very direct and it's, um, it, it, they've made a whole science out of working with the energy, taking it out of its, you know, shamanistic roots where there's a, a, a worshiping of, of this particular energy or a particular kind of energy, whether it's the life force of the sun or life force of the rain, making it elemental like fire and water and really relating it to our bodies and then 
making it very practical to just do our Qigong practice to worship that life force energy in a way that can be replicated and duplicated for everyone, not just the dancers or the shamans. And that's, that's what I love about this practice. But yes, uh, you know, doing hula is a fantastic Qigong practice because you're opening the hips, strengthening the legs and celebrating that life force energy. Mm. Uh, oh, somebody's asking about this uh, banner behind me. This was painted by a Qigong master, Lorelai Chang, and she's an incredible uh, dancer, calligraphist, uh, Qigong master and martial artist. And um, she has said that there's a few of these left if anybody wants to purchase them from her. She has to, she has to uh, print them in China, so she has a few left, she said. But this means Shen, Qi, and Jing or Jing Qi Shen, which is the three treasures. And she had painted this as a gift, uh, as a housewarming gift for us. So that is wonderful. Really beautiful. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> What's the four month class called? Huh? Dalian. Oh, Dalian. I, that's <laughs> you're like what i was very confused <laughs> dao yin is the class that we're going to do that's over four months uh one weekend a month and it's an ancient form of qigong practice dao yin means to guide and direct the life force energy through the mind and the body and that's what we'll be doing in that class very cool how can we get back to regular after the holidays? Wow, is there a regular these days? I don't know if there is, but after the holidays, we've you know often eaten a lot of good food. We've uh, you know socialized, perhaps we've we've we're feeling a little bit uh, disjointed. Come back to a routine. What is what is your ideal day look like? And write it down, journal about it, figure out an ideal few days or an ideal week and then start to implement, you know, start off with the morning practice. I think morning practices can help to establish routines and come back to our center and what's important to us. And, you know, some things we wanna let go of and some things we wanna bring in new. So think about those habits that we wanna transform and we wanna let go of. And not only what do we wanna let go of, but reinstall new things, new energy that we wanna bring in. So bring in some new energy, uh, and think about the habits that you actually want and start to bring those in. And I always think a morning practice is great because it gets the day off on the right foot. And then all of a sudden we start to build upon that foundation. Um, uh, somebody's saying, I can't seem to coordinate my hips with the arm spirals. <laughs> Yeah, that is uh, that is a, that is a uh, common thing. Now, in Qigong, the hips refer often to the center. So we're moving the center of the body. This is the principle of centering. So we move the center and then the arms follow. And when you do this correctly, you have to bring in another principle, which is relaxation. So you relax the arm. So this stays nice and relaxed because if you're trying to move this and move the hips together at the same time, it throws everything off. It's too many things. So this upper body and the arms nice and relaxed. And then as you move the hips, the arm just follows the movement of the hips. So try that really orienting towards the hips in the center, relaxation through the arms, and then just practice. We Here's have that I guest think. appearance. Oh, got a guest appearing. What do you think about moving the hips and the arms at the same time? She's just learning how to move her whole body. Mm -hmm. Often it looks like she's doing Qigong. She does these things with her hands when she's out of her swaddle. Mm. That reminds me of Qigong mastery. Hello, Harper. Hello, Harper. Can you say hi to everybody? Can you say happy Zozi? My nickname is Zozi and uh, Houdini. Mm. We call her Dini for short because she can break out of any swaddle <laughs> like an escape artist. 
an amazing skill. Does she look different than two weeks ago? She does, absolutely. Very alert these days. So you're holding her head up? You say hi, mom. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mom's a little more shy than, uh, than baby. Yeah, fair enough. She is. Ah, hey. Um, hey, honey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for dropping by. <laughs> The late night Qigong practice. Oh, right. No kidding. I've been taking the uh, 9, 9 p.m. to midnight, and then, then mom's pulling the all-nighter. Impressive. That's why I can look this refreshed <laughs> at by 10 a.m. Party all night long, huh? Wow. Such precious, precious little life form. Oh. And if you feel the energy right on the top of the head of a baby, it feels very elevating and connecting to the, speaking of Shen, the Shen, because the baby's energy is still much in that spirit form. So if you get quiet or meditate with a baby near you or on you, it can be a profound Chi experience. Yes, little master. <laughs> she loves looking at the light coming in through the windows. Yeah, who could blame her? <laughs> All right. What other questions do we have, Ben? Well, here's one that I find uh, a little bit interesting. Hi, Lee. How much more effective would it be for overall health doing three hours of practice per day compared to two hours? Oh, my goodness. I know. Well, it's mad. <laughs> you know, for it. that is a personal question because if you are not in good chi shape and you do three hours of practice, it can be too much. Mm -hmm. And if you've been practicing Qigong a lot and frequently and you build up to it, three hours can be incredibly powerful. So two things when you're thinking about your practice, what is the right practice for you in your body at this particular time in your life? Is it two hours? Is it three hours? Uh, what is your goals with the practice? Are you trying to get healthy? Are you trying to clear stress? Are you sleeping better? You want to become a Qigong master? You want to be a teacher? If you want to be a teacher, you know, doing some three hour practices might be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And if you just want to clear stress and sleep better, you know, a two hour practice is plenty. So think about all those things and occasionally do a little more longer practice. Yes, there she is. Thank you, Harper, for saying hi. Hi, Harper. Someone who's not afraid to express her emotional energy. I'll say right in there the moment too. No, no right hesitation. There. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, and certainly I think the, um, the, the potency that we get, for example, like if we come for a week and we do several practices in a day, uh, that can be very, very profound and very um, rewarding. But as you've said, you know, I've seen, certainly seen people uh, just get a massive chi hangover from overdoing it early on. Yeah lost themselves very quickly which i'm sure I, I assume anyway and you'll answer probably whether this is true but i assume if you just kind of pushed through and kept doing it anyway and, and managed to had the, the luxury of being able to sleep a lot when you needed to you probably would end up okay but uh just sort of seems like a hard way to go if you have a normal life that you have to attend to the rest of the time yeah i mean this could be a good follow-up question katie katie brown's asking about the teacher training um, and, and does the teacher training offer any in-person training? And we, we did do a lot of in-person training, you know, in 2019, but, um, you know, not so much these days. So what we do instead is we have it, we record it. Then we have a lot of online live training where, you know, we're doing a Q and a specific for our teacher trainers, like we're doing here. I get online and we, we have a discussion. And I answer all the trainers' questions. And then we have some master classes, either with me or our senior teachers. Uh, and so, and eventually we will, yes, have live trainings, advanced trainings, um, and the same trainings that we have during the teacher training. We'll, we'll do live and in person over a week. And if you are in the teacher training, we, we do offer that. Uh, is it 50% off when you come live if you've done the teacher training, Ben? Yeah, that's right. It, the specific retreats that uh, accompany the five elements and the three treasures. So when we do a five elements or a three treasures, 
if you've done the online version, you've done the teacher training, um, includes those two and incorporates those two topics, then you will be uh, get 50% off attending the retreat if you want to come live as well. And for me, the experience is very different. Um, when I first did my teacher training, it was only available live and that was fine, but you took a lot of notes and then hopefully remembered everything because it's just a lot of information for, uh, for a week or two weeks, two separate weeks. And then you go home and you practice and um, don't really have the ability to review. So now that we have the video footage and we've got the ability to make it available for ongoing review and practicing along with the videos and so forth, I think people are the quality of teachers that we're certifying at the end of the process has really gone up. But coming in person and spending a week with your peers and spending a week, week with Lee and going out to the Redwoods or going out to the beach or going out to a lake in Michigan or wherever you may be uh, when the live training is happening, coming for those retreats is really a transformational experience, um, really shifts things into a different level. So it's less knowledge, it's less information, uh, uh, successful at capturing all the information because it's all delivered in one giant torrent. <laughs> But the transformational experience is, is just profound and rich. So if you possibly can, I, I would definitely recommend doing both for those of you who want to teach. And some of the higher tiers beyond tier one are uh, some of the components will only be available live for that reason, because we really want to make sure that people's uh, energy systems are, are leveling up. Being live is everything. Well, OK, <laughs> it's great, Karen. I agree, but it's uh, it's. We've actually found that the simultaneous practice that we're all doing here carries a lot of energetic uh, potency as well, which I, I just find fascinating. <laughs> Live win, says Natasha. We don't know. Sorry. Hopefully we're, uh, fingers crossed, right? Yeah, we're definitely still in a week. sometime in Zozi. Right, exactly. Fingers crossed. We'll listen to Zozi and she'll, and she'll tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think it's time to bring a, a little bit of Facebook over. Let's do it. We've got a bunch of questions coming in from Facebook. The first is going to be from Henry. Could Lee share some stretches for before a seated meditation and explain the variations of seated postures between Qigong and Buddhism? Qigong seated postures and, and the relationship between Qigong and Buddhism? Yep, that's the one. Okay, yes, we, I mean, we do have a great Qigong for uh, the seated routine. And, you know, there's times in our lives where sitting just makes more sense, whether it's an injury, particular time in life, um, but we want to keep the body moving. So we have a great routine where you do the practices seated. And sometimes I like to do the seated Qigong routine before meditation, you know, open all the joints through the body, do some spinal cord breathing, and then get ready to meditate. That can be a great practice as well. Um, now, Qigong has has roots in different um, philosophical systems and even religion, religious systems. So some Qigong is more specifically related to Buddhism, like the lotus flow that we do, where we're cultivating loving kindness and sending out our compassion. That is a Buddhist Qigong set, for example. And we have Taoist sets, and there's even Confucius sets. And there's the sets that just combine different principles of both Taoism, meaning Taoism, the way in which nature and you relate to nature, work together. And then Buddhism, maybe the cultivation of loving kindness and compassion and being in service. And we combine those to create an overall flow with those Eastern philosophies integrated into movement. So it becomes an embodied meditative practice. Beautiful. And then Darlene has a question regarding breath. I like to alternate reverse breath, wave breath, um, more reverse breath, and then more wave breath. Is there a reason not to play with any of this? I would say not really. Have fun with that. Have fun with the breathing. I would say the only thing is to, to not get so caught up in the breath that we forget to to drop into the flow and that at some point we want to let go of technique and into the flow in in our classes uh, there's a point in which all the work which means gong the gong that you are doing 
we let it go and we let then the work happen through us recognizing that there is things that we do to move the chi but there's also things that the chi does to move us and if we allow that chi to move us we do less and the chi does more like you know bamboo in the wind does the bamboo move the wind no the wind moves the bamboo so at some point let the chi move you and relax so you don't try to breathe you don't try to do this you don't try to move your chi you are allowing the chi to move you and that's what's so hard to do because we're so used to doing everything that we forget to just completely relax into being so there's the doing and the being and when you're in the being it's more of a begin state and more of a flow state so do all those you know breathing exercises and chi exercises and activations towards the beginning of class and then as we progress into the, uh, more towards the end of class, see if you can completely relax into that flow state as, you know, just the, the icing on the cheat cake. Fantastic. And then Adelina has a insomnia question. Could you please recommend some solutions against severe insomnia? Mm. Yes. Okay. So pressure points, um, you know, we have spleen six and kidney one on the lower leg and the bottom of the foot. Those points can be really good for insomnia. So sit on the edge of the bed, massage your feet. The whole sole of the foot can be good, but kidney one, bubbling spring specifically. Spleen six is great. And heart seven, which is right here on the inside of that little bone. And those three points can be great for insomnia. Also, we have uh, routines and flows that can be good for insomnia, anything that's downward and flowing. So I would say pulling down the heavens for a few minutes before bed, even doing this for five minutes and massaging those points can be extremely helpful. If you want more of those kinds of exercises, Qigong for better sleep workshop, try the Qigong for sleep workshop. And we do all kinds of tips and chi tricks to help you sleep really well. Perfect. And then Tina needs some help with her acid reflux. Um, she's tried everything, but hasn't gotten any solid results. Mm. All right. So acid reflux can be a variety of different reasons. It could be dietary, it could be stress, it could be, you know, mental, emotional that has, you know, a long past history. I would say try the Qigong for healthy digestion, that workshop, get really grounded. And maybe the Qigong for emotional balance workshop, those two in combination might give you some real solutions to that. Um, uh, I do like acupuncture as some, for somebody to help, help you out with that problem, um, get some facilitation in the movement and rebalancing of the chi. Some herbs and some acupuncture would also be really wonderful besides in, in, in adjunct to those workshops. Beautiful. And then Tracy is asking, I'm assuming Qigong is good for osteoporosis with some modifications. Is it? Question mark. Yes, absolutely. We talked about osteoporosis. Try that Qigong for bones. It's a program. We filmed that in Yosemite. It's a great workout to bring Qi to the bones. Beautiful. And Sandra is asking, hi, I'd like to know what exercises or advice you would recommend for disc degeneration on the neck and bulging disc in the lower back and skin issues. <clears throat> okay, for, for the discs and the spine, um, gentle, um, here's what I would start with. Start with really emphasizing the flows. In fact, you can do you know, any of the workouts, let's say it's a video class subscription, one of the programs that just lean more into the later part of the exercises to learn how to relax your body and move with soft flowing movements. And that's going to calm the upper back, neck and shoulders. And in fact, when this all relaxes, often the body will realign itself. You can do Qigong for upper back and neck with the caveat of do the beginning part of the class very gently at first. All those stretches in the neck and shoulders, just do it real light and gentle, focusing more on the flows. Um, for skin issues, <clears throat> for skin issues, the pressure point right here on the elbow, this is the point they always talk about for skin. And we went over those pressure points and points like this in the acupressure workshop. Large intestine 11, massage that and do healing sounds because 
skin is often excess heat and the body trying to detoxify somehow. And healing sounds help us to detoxify from the inside out and facilitate that whole process. Wonderful. And someone's asking about ways to deal with the sudden death of their best friend. Um, they want to stitch their reality back together and want to use Qigong in the process. Mm. So sorry to hear that. You know, I mean, here's the thing about life and Qi, when we witness and watch it, it is in a constant process of transformation. And part of that transformation is that this day dies to give birth to tomorrow. And this moment dies to give birth to the next moment. And eventually this physical body dies to give birth to the spiritual body. And that is just the reality of life. And sometimes that process of change and transformation doesn't line up with our ideals, with what we think should happen or with our expectations. And so that very challenging process start to line up to see that life, the part of life and birth and death is a continuum. So that as we look at a horizon of time like birth and death, this is hard for us to wrap our conscious mind around, but know that energy moves in yin and yang in rhythm. So that I'm gonna inhale, then I'm gonna exhale. And that is part of this breath dies to give birth to the next breath. And we feel very comfortable in these short rhythms, even go to sleep, wake up, inhale, exhale, expand, contract. But then birth and death, because it's such a large horizon of time, we get confused and we don't understand. So we develop a lot of anxiety around it. But look that the microcosm is the macrocosm and that rhythms that are small often relate to rhythms that are large. And like going to sleep and waking up, when the body perishes, we wake up into a new reality. And what that reality is, it's an unknown and an exciting frontier. So let's give blessings to your friend and wish them well. Send energy from your heart, thinking of all the fond memories and, and good times and heartfelt love. And just send that to them into their journey as they go on this next adventure. And then come back to the present moment really getting grounded in yourself into this moment, establishing a really good Qigong ritual and routine. So when your life has been disrupted, coming back to routine, every morning at 9 a.m. from 9 to 10, I'm going to do an hour of practice. I'm going to commit to that for myself. And I'm going to just do the practice, even though I don't feel like it. Sometime during the day, commit to a ritual so that you start to get grounded, connected to where you are in this moment. And then that builds a solid foundation into living your life the fullest. Wonderful. And John's asking if you have any books to recommend about shamanic Qigong. Shamanic Qigong. I would say, qi, let me think about this. Montak Chi is book Khan and Lee. The Khan and Lee practice. He's the, I think there's two or three of them that are really wonderful for uh, shamanic kind of ideas and practices. Perfect. And Linda is asking, I just did the Qigong for Winter workshop and I have a uh, kidney transplant in the anterior right lower quadrant below my liver. So when knocking, massaging, or breathing into the kidneys, should I be working over my transplanted kidney? And does this also change any of my meridian points because of the transplant? Oh, that is a great question that I don't have a, a, a solid answer for. My, my, my answer would be to do some inner exploring. And yes, uh, do some work around your kidney. Do kidney breathing. Do kidney acupressure points. Do the kidney flows to integrate that, that your energy and this new organ energy. Um, that's what we want to do. We want this integration to happen smoothly. So I would do exercises like flows of uh, the fountain, for example, would be a really great integration. Um, and pressure points are, are also wonderful to integrate uh, that, that new energy. So we, we have the organ, which is the form, and then we have the energy, which is the formless. And we stitch together form and formless with our practice. We do a movement to move the formless energy. And I think with that transplant, that's exactly what you want to do is stitch together the form and the formless to make it very smooth within your mind-body system. 
Beautiful. And our last question on Facebook is from a viewer in Sweden. What kind of exercises would you recommend for a teenager who has juvenile arthritis and persistent lumbago? I would say do the Qigong for healthy joints. It's a great exercise for teenagers and, and you know, adults alike. And uh, so, you know, that, that's a great, great exercise. I think um, any Qigong for th that the teenager will do, will be good. So flows, you know, maybe that 30 day challenge where it's only seven minutes a day, you know, do it together, have fun with it. And anything that they do to move their body is going to be helpful for the joints and clearing up any stagnant chi. Wonderful. And that should wrap us up for questions on Facebook. Thanks, Zach. My pleasure. Well, we're coming down the home stretch here. Yeah, we are. And uh, we're going to take just a couple of folks who want to come and be on camera and ask you whatever questions they have directly. And since we've only got time for a couple of folks, uh, we will hopefully move quickly. So well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit the lower all hands button. And if you'd like to ask a question, there's a raise hand button at the bottom. Or if you don't see it, you can go over to participants and then hit raise hands. And the reason that we lower all the hands is just to make sure that the people who uh, raise their hand are actually there right now, ready to go. So um, we don't uh, necessarily take the folks who had their hands raised uh, initially. So raising your hand early doesn't actually do much, but we will uh, instead take them now. And the reason for that is we had a couple of cases where people raised their hands and then wandered off. And so when we tried to bring them in, they never showed up. So, Gabriella, you are first. Gabriella will be coming in in just a second here. And we can see you and we can hear you. Go right ahead. Thanks. Hi, Ben. Hi, Lee. Congratulations on the baby. Thank you so much. Um, and a special thank you to, to your whole team. So I just want to leave that out there um, for, some, for some support. Um, anyway, I'm, I have a question for you. I uh, practice the postures of power every morning. Great. Um, and and uh, you know, it says that when you do the iron bridge, it will basically say that your body will shake. Why does it shake? And also, because I do it every morning, you know, I tend to keep the, my stances as, as long as possible. And sometimes I've noticed that that shaking will extend into some of the standing postures. Sorry, this is Memphis making some noise here. <laughs> oh, I, I thought that was the Egyptian statue behind you barking. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm what gonna a, have to what leave. A cool but yeah. so why do why does the body shake? Okay, so the body shakes for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's the cheese moving, and that bioelectricity is opening up through the meridians. So we call that more yang energy, like electricity. Right. Sometimes the body will shake and vibrate, and that's that yang energy moving and circulating, breaking through blockages, becoming activated. Right. And sometimes the body will move like seaweed in the ocean. And these both these spontaneous movements happen without you voluntarily doing it. Right. Okay. So seaweed in the ocean is a more of a yin expression. You're like, wow, I'm not moving, but my body is moving by itself. Or sometimes my body vibrates. Now, your body has these natural movements within it already. Like you don't, right. your body's naturally beating its heart. Your body's naturally breathing. So spontaneous movements happen all the time. But right. when you do Qigong, sometimes they activate and do different things that we're not used to. So it's a little unusual. But just know that it's a body release, a spontaneous movement, that it's not voluntary, but it can be controlled through right. your voluntary activities. So they call them, let's say, in the West, sometimes these exercises are known as bioenergetics. Right. You hold a posture and the energetics start to become activated. So these are activations that circulate chi and they start to move past our voluntary actions into involuntary actions that you want to work with to for the goal of opening up and strengthening our energy system. And that's exactly what's happening. OK, so because because I try to hold the postures longer that, you know, the more I practice, 
Yeah. And, you know, bend the knees a little deeper. So Great. what starts to happen is I feel like there's a slight vibration taking place in the bones, you know, and then as soon as I start the flows at the end of that workout, you know, then it, that, you know, then that, then that trembling stops. Yes. Uh, second question, just technically embrace, embracing the tree and the lower embracing the tree, I mean, and the Wu Chi postures are the same, right? Correct. Thank you. Correct. Because sometimes you refer to one and sometimes the other, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it's the same. Yeah, one. sometimes I say lower embracing the tree to, so I don't have to explain what Wu Chi is every single time. Right, okay. But there, right. is that, there is that element of Wu Chi, which means emptiness or not doing right. and not forcing in all the standing postures. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was it. Um, Wonderful. And Keep up. That, happy that's, New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. And we, those standing postures are just wonderful practices, extremely powerful and energizing. And, and, you know, the next step to the postures of power might be the Iron Shirt Workshop. I would, love, I would love to do it. It's on my list of things to, you know, get, because I'm teaching and Great. I'm my website should be ready for online teaching first of February. So, you know, improving my practice and my skill is definitely on my, on my uh, radar all the time. But yeah, the postures of power, I have trouble doing anything else when I get out of bed first thing in the morning. I just love it. A wonderful, what a great practice. Good for okay. you. All right. Well, have a wonderful, have a wonderful time. We'll talk next time. Thank talk you. Next time. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. A couple of people are asking what are postures of power? You can find those in our legacy series. Actually, it's a series of standing postures that are uh, quite potent. It's quite a potent practice as Gabriella has discovered. And so if you look in the website, you go for, uh, to all products and you Go find the legacy series you can find postures of power there and uh we're gonna do one more dvora and uh there we go and let's get the video and the audio going Hopefully. <laughs> Here we go. We got audio. How about some video? Got my video. Comes ah. video. Perfect. We can see you. We can hear you. <laughs> Hello. Please go so, right ahead. It's a bit dark in my room. I put my glasses on, otherwise I can't see properly. Um, I have a question. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> that's obviously why I'm here. I had heart surgery three months ago. I had one five years ago, and um. I, I didn't pay much attention to the scar down the front of my body, but my um, acupuncture friend who I used to see always mentioned she tried to do some things with electrical things. And I never really understood it, but this time I felt quite overwhelmed. And I just recently, I, at the beginning of the year, uh, I started to do Qigong and then I had a mad series of, of, of physical things that went completely wrong. And then I had to have this valve replaced three months ago. And then I just started your course um, because it, I am a yoga teacher as well as an art uh, singer. And I, um, I, I just started your uh, Sounds True course um, a month ago because it was what I could do. And I was very fascinated with Qigong. Mm. And I realized that yoga is something I cannot do right now. Mm -hmm. And so I became very aware of this, um, this, this energy. And I wanted to know how my scar affects or which meridian is it connected to? Sorry, I couldn't think, think of how to say it. Which meridian is it connected to and how it, does it affect me, uh, puts me out of balance and how can I concentrate on it in Qigong? Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm doing a course and I'm learning about all these acupressure points and... <laughs> Yeah, Wonderful. that's so great. Good for you. And now, okay, scar tissue, right, from any operation, it's like, um, think of it like a boulder in a river. 
And the chi, yeah. as we get more chi, is like having more water. And this water is going to flow around the boulder. So don't worry about it so much. With any scar, you can help by just massaging. If it's on the chest, for example, you know, massaging that scar tissue superficially around the chest. Yeah, um, yeah. Anywhere, anywhere in the body, you can do a little massage, a little tapping, and just help, yeah. help that. And then you're going to do more qigong and get more water in the river. It's just going to flow around it. What does water do? It starts to wear it down and make it smoother. So it's just going to be part of you. It's going to be the beautiful part of your inner beauty and landscape. So <laughs> no worry about that. Okay. And, yeah. You know, we have the Qigong for Healthy Hearts uh, workshop and um, and program. So you might enjoy that just to keep working with that heart energy. And, uh, yeah. you know, heart is more than just the, you know, the physical energy. So it's also helpful to work with the the energy of the hearts and the emotional energy of the heart, the loving kindness and all yes, of I that. Yes, I do that. Um, your, um, this thing, this yes. exercise you do. But I've been, uh, for five years since the last one, I got very fascinated with the power of the heart. So yeah. I, through Greg Braden, started to learn about the, the power of the, the heart and I access it every day through a meditation. Good. Um, uh, so I'm, and I teach it to a lot of students. So I'm very aware of the power of my heart. It's not just an organ. Well, that's I, what the world needs more of, huh? Especially as we move into 2021. Yeah, yeah. That's in touch with the power of our hearts. Yeah, that's my purpose. <laughs> I think yeah, I good. got, you know, opened up twice, and, and yeah, also there was something else at the beginning of, of of the year. Something strange happened with some virus, and my kidneys failed. And so I thought, you know what? I've been restored. And I've been thrown back in this world and I, I really just want to bring that energy from this place. It's very, uh, especially when I do your, this thing, <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but I really get very overwhelmed with emotions and I'm giving out a lot. That's that, my is called the, that is called the Lotus Flow. And because, oh, of your experience, because of your experience, you have a special gift to share with the world. So stay on tune and stay in touch with that and uh, teach us all about the power of the heart. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Lee. And thank you for your classes. That I really appreciate them. They're great uh, uh, online things. I, I find I feel very connected uh, when I'm doing it and I'm enjoying learning uh, through your course. <laughs> so it's really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Devorah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> you in class. <laughs> thank you. Well, if we hadn't started a few minutes late, I would say we're running a couple minutes behind, but we're right on time. Mm -hmm. Would you care to uh, send us off with a little closing, Lee? And uh, let's do it. Rest of our day, as you like to say. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining us in this first tea ritual Q and A for 2021. Um, let's keep our sights on what we want to create and let's not make it just uh, lofty inspirations. Let's bring it down into this, into this physical world. Let's manifest our dreams and desires, write those lists, put them into practice, get those rituals, those daily rituals into practice so that your days lead into your weeks that lead into your months that create your destiny. And so stay lined up with your positive intentions and connected to your highest vision of what this year can be. So here's cheers to that. Many blessings, much loving kindness to you all. Indeed, I'll drink to that. Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we will see you in class or on the next Tea with Lee or at the Dalian weekends or somewhere sometime soon. Thanks again.